Hi, and welcome back, everybody, to the Startup Studios podcast with Raj and Seth. How are you doing, Raj? My dude, what's going on? Doing well, man. Uh, it's been a fun week, uh, very busy, but hanging in there. How about you? I always love like when people use adjectives like, oh, it's interesting. You're like, <laughs> like interesting, like the, the moon is falling out with gravitational orbit pull, or like interesting, like I got a new toothbrush. It's all awesome. it so, so. could be either or at any second of I any like your time. Style. <laughs> all good here, man. Excited for today. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I'm super excited to introduce you to uh a friend of mine, Eric Sofir, who um actually well, first off, welcome, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> And to give you a little, a little bit of backstory, um, Rod, so Eric and I are fraternity brothers from different colleges. And through the power of LinkedIn, I believe, or maybe through the, the fraternity early stages of their database, um, Eric was visiting the Bay Area from the East Coast, and I was able to just kind of connect with him. This was, it was also a very interesting time because I, as a young, egotistical, you know, high energy founder, uh, running a startup accelerator in Silicon Valley. I, you know, and um, Erica, I, I'm not sure if you ever met my buddy Rand, um, who was my co-founder there. I did. Because, I okay. Did when, you so, the, when you gave me the tour. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so we met right when startups was probably at its peak. And then Eric has been a friend as an advisor through a lot of ups and downs since. Um, so I'm I'm interested and and I'm I'm so appreciative of all the uh, all the just advice and you know somebody who I can uh, like just reach out to and and uh, and speak to very openly. So I'm I'm super excited to have you on the podcast. Yeah, uh, terrific. I'm I'm glad to be here and uh, I think the topic of LinkedIn is probably a discussion for another day. But so many great uses for LinkedIn and so many opportunities. And if you're using it just as a as a news feed, maybe that's great, but it's so much more powerful than that. And uh, you have those connections for a reason. So make use of them. Yeah. And and this, uh, I think when we met, uh, when you mentioned the office space, that was like 2013, maybe. Um, that sounds about right. So, yeah, almost 10 years now. And and uh, world was a little different back then. Right. And and not only that, but the the kind of variety of startups that Eric has seen me just just try. He's on my list of people to send even the the, the shittiest of pitch decks to, and just expect like, okay, listen, you got to change this, you got to change that, um, and not be offended by it, you know. So it's it's very rare to have that in people, and and so thank you first off for that, Eric. A shitty pitch deck doesn't mean a a, a shitty company. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like. A, I I sent this to somebody because, you know, selfishly, Eric, we're in the middle of a raise and it's like, I'm a, I, I've, I've done my thing and had some fun and we'll talk about it. But it's so funny. Um, we're getting big picture stuff. We're just getting opted out from box checking on the deck. And I'm like, what the? And 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 then I see this guy he comes on and he's with a lot of people and he's like, oh, yeah, I, I don't make a deck. He's like, I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I raised 29 million bucks on my series A without a deck. I was like, hmm. he's like, here is our company. If you want me to make you a deck, whoever you are, you're going to sign cursory docs as a lead. You're going to like, I was like, what? 29 million bucks. And I was like, son of a bitch. And that's why I always lean into it. Cause we have a great company going on, but like, you know, when you don't have a network and you're spraying and praying with this generic thing that has no narrative as a founder, you're like, What? And it's just really interesting that he was staunchly opposed to even making a deck. And and we're gonna get into it because yeah, actually, sorry, it just it seems uh, so apropos. <laughs> no, 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 it's a great question. I'm uh, for later on because Eric is also part of the early stage team at uh, the firm where he's at now. Um, and but I think that's a great segue into Eric. I'd love for you to meet my buddy Raj. <laughs> And Raj, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, Eric, so I appreciate it. So the formal introduction, I'm Raj. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm the non-technical kid in this this circus. Uh, born and raised in, in Texas. So did the small prep school, played college ball, um, went to medical school because that's what all young immigrants with four physicians in their family do. But I quit, uh, went into Goldman Sachs, Energy Investment Banking, left there to start a hedge fund. Grew that to about a billion, two over 12 years, had an exit, and then moved to Seattle with my family. Was uh, kind of chomping at the bit to follow my second life of ha passion, health and wellness, collegiate professional athlete. So 
did some direct consumer brick and mortar wellness companies that a SaaS solution came from it. Uh, and we've been kind of scaling that throughout the US and lucky enough to meet Seth exactly where you mentioned, Eric, on LinkedIn. Uh, we started rapping, had some great conversation, went to work together. And I was like, cool, man, this kid gets it. And honestly, that was a power of LinkedIn as well. Um, just taking punts and, and going back and forth with him. And I was like, cool, let's do this. And then every tangential networking thing that has happened basically from there. Nice. Yeah. That's yeah, Roger, funny. And and as somebody, Eric, who's uh, seen me go through a lot of ups and downs, right? And, and kind of rebuild myself over and over. Um, Raj has played a pivotal role in the previous, the, the most recent buildup. So, you know, I'm excited to not only leave for you guys to connect because I feel like I keep failing up somehow, in, you know, professionally, which is interesting to say. But, um, you know, for you guys, as people in my network who are amazingly successful and, and very open, I'm just super excited for you guys to connect. And, and can't wait to hear the story. Know. Exactly. Yeah. So with that being said, let's kind of dive into it. Um, who is Eric Sofit? This is a good question. Um, and a million places to start. Uh, you want me to start at the at the beginning? You're, you're a Virgo. Yep. Sure. So <laughs> so um I'm currently I'm uh I'm a partner at Foley and Warner in Washington, DC. Uh, but uh, I grew up on Long Island uh and for years, wanted to be an engineer, loved figuring out how things worked. And my father was an attorney, he was a tax attorney, CPA. And I thought, I never want to be an attorney, never want to go to law school. Uh, I was intent on being an engineer. And I went to uh, Cornell Engineering and uh, was majoring in material science and engineering uh, because it had such a broad array of, of applications. It was semiconductors one day and hip implants the next day and tennis rackets the next day. And, and I was like, this is really fascinating because uh, I'm touching every type of engineering. Even had a, uh, a class where I did a paper on um, uh, on beef jerky and the, the, bio, the bio properties of, of beef jerky and how it relates to uh, the taste of beef jerky. Also a discussion for another day. Uh, but <laughs> it turns out um, people like like Slim Jim, because it's so much easier to chew, is is really my conclusion there. <laughs> anyway, they gave me a degree for that. But uh, uh, as I was um, as I was in engineering school, uh, my parents were like, "Well, what are you going to do for a living? You know, you're going to get a master's degree, advanced degree, uh, and uh, uh, you know, what kind of job are you looking for?" And uh, I I was exploring different things. Uh, I tried the business side of it took some business school classes and I thought this really isn't for me. It's a lot of, uh, at least from the academic side, it seemed like a lot of buzzwords and, uh, and we were moving further from the engineering part of it uh, and more into this consulting type speak. And I thought this, this isn't the direction I want to move. I wanted, I really still want to be in the engineering side, uh, but I was doing research uh, for an electrical engineering professor on gallium nitride, trying to find the first, semiconductor to emit uh, blue light. So just a way to um, date myself there, uh, you know, when you, because because for these uh, flat screen displays, uh, for all sorts of applications, you need, you need blue light, right? To get, to get a display, you need red, green, and blue. We had red and green, uh, we didn't have blue. So just even thinking back uh, to what your VCR or whatever, you know, electrical appliance you had, uh, in the 90s, uh, the on button was always red or orange or green, right? It was never blue, uh, but we needed that blue. And the blue meant um, better storage capabilities, better uh, telecom and, and big TVs. And, and we talked about with that professor about like, you could have TVs the size of billboards. And nowadays we do. We have billboards that are TVs, right? Um, and, and I was in the lab for a year and a half making samples, growing samples, testing samples. I go from one lab to test it to another lab across campus to test it different way. And we're making slow and steady progress. Uh, we weren't the ones to come up with the uh, uh, the product that I was uh, hoping we would in that, in that year and a half, but we did make some good progress on it. Uh, uh, but I thought, this is not really, this is not really who I am. I'm not the guy who's gonna sit in the lab and do this day after day. And we'd have people come in from 
from large organizations and tell us about their life as an engineer. And I thought, oof, this, this does not sound like me um, working on that same print cartridge for four years or working in the feminine hygiene products division. These, these are both real examples. <laughs> these, it's just not something I wanted to do or even wanted a business card that said I did that. <laughs> so, um, so I said, all right, let me, let me explore the law, even though it's the last thing I want to do. And I worked at a uh, patent firm in downtown Ithaca. And every day I was there, we'd see something new. And, and it was someone who was working really hard on it. And I would just help them take credit for it. It'd be a, you know, solo inventor that that came along and said, I have this great idea for a, a bag that goes in the the, um, the flatbed of your truck or a humidifier for your violin case. Uh, or it could be something from Cornell that had to do with uh, chocolate cheese or, or better browning mozzarella. And uh, and I thought this is really fascinating because because I get to use my engineering and someone else is going to do all that hard work and I'll just help them take credit for it. And move on to the next one. I thought it was, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, so, so that's the path I continued on, went to, uh, went to law school, continued taking jobs at different firms and uh, exploring different aspects of it, uh, working in, in different cities. I worked in, uh, in Alexandria, just outside DC. I've worked in DC, uh, worked in Reston, Virginia, uh, back in the dot-com boom, uh, when, when that was really a growing place in the Dulles Corridor. Um, worked in Charlotte, North Carolina, great experience, great town, uh, and, uh, and worked in Boston as well. Uh, so were these for like multiple firms or the same firm? These were, uh, some of them were the same firm. Some of them were multiple firms. Uh, as you know, I worked, took a job after, after law school, working at a firm right by the patent office, uh, then went to law school in New Hampshire at a place called Franklin Pierce Law Center, now part of UNH. A school that specializes in IP, knowing that's what I wanted to do, focus on intellectual property. And then during the summer, I get different jobs and, and try out different things. And then, and then over the course of my career, uh, I've had a few different jobs, but, but I, and I, I have helped with, with numerous things, whether it's, um, whether it's licensing issues or uh, M&A or litigation, um, though, though the core part, the bread and butter is, is always comes back to to why I got into it in the first place. It's it's hearing about the new innovations, um, hearing about that great technology, and finding a way to help them protect it. And so, what really drives me these days uh, is is not just helping people and helping companies, but also uh, I see some new technology and I think I want to get involved with that. I want to help them and uh, see how that works and help them take credit for it and uh, and and just love seeing. Love seeing the new stuff. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Well, um, we, let's maybe dive a little deeper into like uh, some of the early stage companies that you work with or um, how, because, because most of our audience is tailored towards, we believe, pre-seed seed and maybe some series A. Um, and I know when people Google you or as part of the description, they're going to see, you know, fancy law firm name. But really, I want people to come out with, is this somebody that at, at what stage do you enjoy kind of getting dirt, you know, uh, getting your hands dirty with these founders? Yeah, you you're saying like he's on a fancy Web page, but but show us why he's not fancy. Exactly. Well, it, why you're relatable to an early stage founder. <laughs> I, I get it. Because yes. when I um, so Rod, sorry to cut you off, but no, no, no. for example, when I was working with uh, startup law lawyers, right, I came at it from a different, uh, you know, I was writing the accelerator high and we were able to work with like, for example, you, there was uh, other people in the network who were going to be interviewing, but it was every time I've been uh, coming at it from a founder hat, it's always from a different lens. And yeah. at, at what stage do you think, especially seeing IP and seeing so many different kinds of companies, at what stage are you most um, most valuable, let's say, for uh, one of our audience kind of targeted, um, you know, pre-seed seed or Series A founders? 
because it's, yes. it's 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 actually wildly intimidating. And I'm I'm lucky because I'm actually just kind of going through this right now, um, Eric, or kind of you know, of uh, uh, 17 months into it. And I'm a non-technical founder. Um, I've never raised VC money. I've never talked to angels. I raised money for my hedge fund, but it was drastically different. It's not like, hey, here's our here's our DCF model for our burn and run rate and valuation. But it's like, no, here you gave me a dollar, turn it into this. That's it. So, I mean, I remember picking up the phone and and talking to Seth about it and then being like, hey, listen, we engaged with like Perkins Cooey. And so I take a step back and it's intimidating. You know, you go on their website, you're paying a, a partner who's probably 1200 bucks and you're just like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, what's a VC? So, you know, you, then you, you go, if I'm just going to be honest, maybe go mom and pop and then that's great too. But at the same time, mom and pop are like, oh, so you're spitting out these SPVs on each about on your reggae, but they're like, shit. But and, and then there's the the person in the middle who's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. So, so a couple ways to answer that question. I want to make sure I hit I hit all of it. Um, the the one of those questions was was why the big flashy firm versus uh, versus a small firm, yeah. and uh, uh, there are good lawyers good lawyers everywhere. One of the reasons I joined Foley, and I was at an even bigger firm uh, with many times, that was many times the size uh, until about three and a half years ago. Uh, one of the reasons I joined Foley was uh, the area of expertise. So uh, we have hundreds of corporate lawyers and hundreds of IP lawyers, but it means they're focusing on areas like uh, venture capital and startup companies and uh, issues that are relevant to them, like uh, like IP and and even parts of IP like privacy issues, uh, and uh, and we have a whole technology licensing group. So so when when a client or a contact of mine comes to me with an issue, it's not a it's not a person that says I could do everything. No, I go to the actual expert and uh, and. And that's what they do day in and day out. They're doing that that same kind of work. They've seen it, they've done it. Uh, and and oftentimes, even though their rate is a lot higher, they can do it so much more efficiently because they have a template for it or they've done it before. They they can answer that question on a phone call rather than having to do uh, the research, right? You're talking to someone who's got some of the most experience in that field because they are able to specialize in that particular area. Um, I've spent the last you know, 20 plus years in the, in the patent space, uh, and developing, honing my expertise. Uh, if there's someone who said, you know, I do patents and trademarks, copyrights and venture capital and, and corporate formation and m and I'd be like, well, how many years could you really have spent, you know, honing your, your skill on, on each of those things? Uh, cause at 20 years, I still feel like I'm learning sometimes. So, uh, so there's some value to having the expert. Uh, certain firms, and not all firms, but certain large firms like ours understand the financial sensitivities of of startup companies. Uh, doesn't mean we don't want to get paid, uh, but what it means is we understand at an early stage that you don't have a lot of money to put toward, toward certain things, so we want to make sure you're getting what you need, and then at a later stage, we can work on the things you you should probably do. Um, but but we know how to stagger those things and we know how to prioritize those things. We also have some packages, uh, more on the corporate side, uh, packages for startup companies for formation and, and those types of things that are very competitive and uh, and get you what you need to, to get the company going or help with, uh, with some of your fundraising. Uh, another reason to go with a um, larger firm, uh, I don't want to necessarily say more reputable, but in some cases that's that's the best term for it, is it gives the startup some credibility too. When the investors come along and they see uh, that you're working with Foley uh, and for IP, for corporate, whatever it is, they know you're taking that seriously. They know you have someone giving you real good guidance on the other side uh, versus saying, well, we know we have to check this box. We're just trying to do it uh, you know, as cheaply as possible. We we got our corporate formation done uh, online uh, through a website, and and that's good enough. Uh, because you start looking into that stuff, and and there's 
there's so many holes in it. Uh, and I've seen the, the IP that's been pursued online and it's a disaster. Uh, so, so, um, there's value to going to the big firm, a reputable firm like Foley for, uh, the reputation, the cost isn't going to be as much as you think it is. And you're going to get the, the expertise, uh, that you want. Now, my practice, I, I work with startup companies that are anything from, Hey, I got an idea to, um, fortune 50 companies and everything in between. And there's, there's things I like about all those different types of clients. Uh, they all bring different things to the table, uh, all bring, uh, different types of technology and issues, um, and allows us to, to think about things from a, from a different perspective, whether it's, uh, not just protecting the IP, but what do we do with this IP and, and who is the intended target of it? Uh, and how do we best protect this company? And uh, if they're going to be, uh, their goal is to be bought by another company or their goal is to go after another company, exclude them from the market. How do we, how do we build that, that type of strategy for them? Um, for the early stage companies, uh, there are a few critical things to think about uh, when think about an IP, uh, strategy, uh, and, and, you know, your question was when they should talk, when should they talk to us? And, and I think the answer is as soon as possible. Uh, we don't have to necessarily start work right away. Uh, I'm not going to start the clock right away, but we, we need to, to start that discussion of when to protect the IP as soon as possible, because once you start discussing your your innovation, your technology. Uh, once you start selling it, the clock is ticking uh, for your for your IP rights. Uh, in the United States, you get a year from that that disclosure date uh, to file something in the in the U.S. Patent Office. In other places, like in Europe, once you disclose it, you're precluded from any protection. So, it it's a shame. It's it's sad, really, to see a company's great idea come to us and they say, "Oh yeah, we've been selling this for for." 18 months and we're like, great, you know, you've lost all your rights to protect this. Tell us about what you have going on in the future and we'll figure out how to, uh, how to, how to get you, get you some protection for that. So we really want to start that discussion early and, and figure out how to, um, how we can protect it in an economical manner moving forward. Uh, and in a way that when the investor sees it, uh, or the public sees it, uh, we've represented numerous companies that are, that have gone public. We want we want them to 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 kick the tires on it and say, oh yeah, there's there's real IP here, there's a real strategy. They're taking through taking the steps to uh, protect things when they come along, treating them seriously, and uh, and they're going to get some meaningful uh, protection out of it. So uh, when when you're an early stage company, there's something we have in the United States called a provisional application that that we oftentimes use for early stage companies. Uh, but it could be used by anyone and, and oftentimes is, but a provisional application allows you to uh, basically put your stake in the ground. Uh, and we have one year then to file the non-provisional application. The non-provisional application is the one that everyone knows that gets examined by the patent office, can't really change it. And uh, 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 that's the one, if you're going to file it overseas, you're going to file that one too. Uh, but that provisional application is, is a robust technical legal paper. 20, 30, 40 pages, uh, whatever it is that we write up to describe uh, the invention. Uh, the provisional application doesn't have those strict formatting requirements with a lot more flexibility with it. Now there's some risk that comes along with it. The idea of the of the provisional is you're going to get the benefit of that filing date if you have uh, support for your invention in that provisional application. If we write that provisional application like that robust non-provisional, it's going to have that support because we've written it that way to ensure that it has the support. If uh, we take, let's say, let's say we're going to, it's going to be presented in a, uh, in a conference tomorrow and we just take your slide deck and file it today as your provisional. Well, then we have a lot of risk because it may or may not be adequately described in that in that slide deck that we're filing as a provision application. Uh, it's gonna cost a lot less uh, because we don't really have any drafting to do. 
uh, just some just some filing and maybe a quick review, uh, but you're going to have that risk. And so we have that whole range of of what do we do from that slide deck to the full blown provisional patent application. Uh, anything in between, uh, it's sort of a sliding scale of well, how much work do you want us to do, uh, knowing that it affects the risk and it affects the the cost. And so with various entities, we've we've played around with uh, with different strategies, whether uh, they do some of the writing, uh, whether we, we just assume the risk, uh, a lot of them uh, because time is limited uh, and, and because of the risk, just want us to go ahead with the, with the drafting uh, as, a, as a full non-provisional type application. But, um, but the options are out there, right? The, what I'm trying to convey is that we have that flexibility. Now, once we follow that provisional, we have a year to follow the non-provisional. When you're a startup and these ideas are still under development, uh, you know you've just you've just said, all right, here's we have this idea as of this date. You don't have to have a demo or a prototype or anything like that. Um, but you're going to say maybe in six months you say, oh, we have a new way of doing it or a better way of doing it or these new features we want to add. Well, then when we prepare the non-provisional, we can add those in there uh, and um, and have an even more robust non-provisional application. So we have that kind of flexibility and uh, uh, and way to um, uh, adjust the price, uh, adjust the priority of things. Uh, if there are a few ideas, maybe some go to straight to non-provisional and some go to provisional and we can evaluate later what we uh, what we want to continue or and what we want to continue to uh, invest in or, or abandon some of the ideas. So uh, I'd say let's have that discussion early. I'd rather I'd rather set up a, a bi-monthly call or something where we, or a quarterly call where we where we say let's let's chat about this every couple of months or to to figure out where we are and if we're ready to file it yet, than to come in too late and uh, and the the opportunity to protect it is uh, is gone. Yeah, that, I think that's a really good point because everybody usually comes to people like you more as a reaction to something current versus thinking kind of forward. So that must be a pretty good filter for you guys as well. Because um, I've said it before where I, I believe lawyers uh, are an awesome lawyer for any startup or any uh, founder is like a superpower because they're connected to every side of the spectrum on the business side. They're well-respected and they work within uh, you know, the law. So um, yeah, it's... What kind of startups would qualify for thinking about IP? Because you know, usually when people think about startups, it's a lot of tech, it's a lot of you know, building an app or let's say a no-code builder or something, right? A prototype and then trying to build something custom. Is that also patentable? Yeah, I I hate to put it on the I hate to put it on a founder to have them make the determination of what's patentable and when to make that call. I'd rather explore it with them and and help guide them as to what I think might be patentable. We do a lot of work in the uh, in the software, fintech, insure tech, health tech space. That means we're dealing with AI every day, blockchain, right? All the all the buzzwords uh, that you hear about lately. Uh, a lot, you know, if I had a, a nickel for every time I heard generative AI. Uh, <laughs> recently uh but but we've been in that space for for a while even before it was called ai we were we were doing ai um i had mentioned i was uh, a material science engineer from from college but when i when i started my career uh as a lawyer we uh we didn't have um uh we didn't have the clients in the space i really wanted to be in and so i started doing a lot of fintech and software uh for uh banks and government contractors. And uh, what that became over time uh, was, was kind of this evolution of this FinTech career became this evolution to see how, um, how patent eligibility has really uh, changed and, and progressed. Now, patent eligibility is the issue that, uh, that's what us patent lawyers call it, but what the, what the inventors, what the founders might call it is, well, this is a business method. This isn't patentable. Uh, there's there's a statute, uh, without going in too much into the weeds here, there's a statute, section 101, 
right? The first statute, uh, the, the first criteria for the examiners, uh, is this something that's eligible for protecting? Uh, and um, the courts have been all over the place. Uh, I remember uh, in the dot-com boom, there was a court case that came out and they said, they said, yeah, you can basically protect anything. And the floodgates opened, especially in the dot-com boom. Floodgates opened and people were protecting everything. It's just, well, now we can do it on the internet. Uh, and then uh, in, in around 2008 or so, there was a Supreme Court case and said, hold on, hold on. It's got to, your innovation's got to be tied to some sort of technology here. You can't just have something that um, where, where at the end you say, and then we display the results on a computer screen. And that's actually how people were getting around some of these things. Uh, and uh, and that was like, well, that seems like a, you know, a simple drafting exercise. We could get around that pretty easily. Uh, uh, so business as usual. Then in 2014, the Supreme Court came out with another case. And they're kind of like, you know what, forget everything we've said. Uh, there's a different test that you need to apply. And what they really did there was they tried to set some policy, but they didn't want to see those inventions that were uh, merely just applied to the internet, were things that were decades old, or hundreds of years old, where now you're using a computer because it's just more efficient to do that. And that's been interpreted uh, by the courts and by the patent office uh, drastically differently. Uh, things are better than they were before, uh, but uh, uh, the, the courts and the patent office are still trying to find their way uh, into uh, what that, what those, rules really mean. Uh, generally, what it means is when we write these applications, we have to focus on uh, a technical solution to a technical problem. Uh, we need to frame it in terms of how does this solution work in a way that it's uh, it's something that a human couldn't do. It's not something a human's going to do in their mind. And uh, you know, like I said, we were, we're dealing with this every day. So this isn't something that that the average engineer is going to is going to be able to drill down into that that idea. Uh, it could be something where it's a new kind of user interface, uh, a new functionality on an interface. It could be something that uses some sort of AI engine, has some sort of interesting training or or machine learning aspect to it. It could be some interesting development uh, using blockchain technology. So uh, all those things are uh, are something that that we can use as a hook to to show the courts to show the patent office this is something that's that's eligible for for patenting the mere ideas of um, sending and receiving data storing data uh, retrieving data those types of things aren't really uh, going to get us over that hurdle uh, so what we like to do particularly for the for the software or business method type, uh, innovations, or just talk through it. And then afterwards, we come back to them and we say, uh, really interesting product. We don't protect products per se, we protect innovations. And these are the innovations that I think we can protect here. Uh, and uh, and that'll be based on our experience and and what we've seen with how do we, can we frame this in a way that that will likely overcome these, these hurdles? So, so again, I, I advise anyone to just, uh, if you're unsure, pick up the phone, let's schedule a meeting and, and just talk through the idea and see what you have and what might be patentable. And maybe it's not ready yet because you're still developing it, uh, but uh, uh, let's make sure we get that protection beforehand and, and understand the risks of, of not protecting it or the likelihood of success if you do try to protect it. And actually, one one point to make. So we, I was super fortunate where when I was with Delta Leaf, and being in the cannabis space, right, we knew most of the market wouldn't really work with us. But as soon as I spoke with Eric, he was like, "Hey, we have an entire cannabis division. Let me connect you." Uh, so we were very fortunate for about a year. We were able to work with with Foley very closely. And um, again, this is for a lot of our audience viewers to find out themselves by just picking up the phone or or reaching out. Um, but it was considering the stage we were at and and the amount of revenue we were doing, um, if it, it was very very affordable uh, to kind of get the the advice, the the years of experience, and just the the uh, 
uh, the the sense of security because as a founder, I would feel like it's a step up when you start thinking about that and when you start to, uh, dealing with wanting to protect everything that you built, protect yourself, protect your employees, protect your other stakeholders, um, and protect your baby, right, that you've, you've worked so hard to, to build. And there are so many different firms out there to, to speak to, but um, you know, when it comes to the larger ones, it's also really good to know that you can uh, just connect with somebody randomly and uh, they'll give you some time. Um, so that's that's pretty awesome any any kind of insight into like your um like some of your favorite kind of customers in the past or uh, to give a sense of what kind of companies you enjoy uh, dealing with yourself so i've had i've had uh, it's dozens of startups that I've, I've worked with uh there are there are a few that have been uh very well funded uh, a couple unicorn startups and and uh, those are exciting because their issues accelerate to those of a more established company uh, uh, and so it's it's fun to grow with them uh, and and things are uh, much more dynamic and uh, and urgent when we have those types of companies right they want to keep that status and they uh, uh, they have competitors that are they're right on their heels and they're they're taking on some of the you know the the big companies in that space uh but they also have to keep those investors happy so those are those are uh exciting uh engagements uh and and a lot of those have been around wireless charging and autonomous vehicles and uh um a lot of artificial intelligence type uh and machine learning innovations uh but um, but I deal with a lot of other early stage companies, and some of them are for uh, for software. Some of them are even for uh, for widgets, for things you you uh, sell a product you sell. And that's that's a tough business uh, to to raise money, um, but uh, but becomes interesting from a patent perspective because the patents become so meaningful so fast uh it it does with with software as well but i'll, I'll explain that i'll explain that as well the for, for when we have a um when we have a company that makes up a product uh and uh uh you know some some smart home automated product for instance uh it it's uh it's interesting uh when you see the other devices that are that are trying to do the same thing uh, and you have to work around uh, you know their intellectual property to, to try to get your own uh, and this is this kind of technology I'm thinking is also similar to uh, I was just at a robotics and AI conference last week and it, it's similar to the, the issues they're going uh, they're dealing with their kind of early stage but people are ramping up their their pad portfolios and and starting to say well well you're taking my customers we need to get more serious about this. Uh, but also, but but robotics might be a little bit different than consumer products because with consumer products, uh, we're dealing with Chinese knockoffs and we're dealing with uh, copycats all over the place and uh, uh, sometimes even out of the same factory in China. Uh, so what we uh, what we need to deal with are uh, ag aggressive IP stances, uh, worthwhile protection, not just can't just check that box and say, yep, patent pending or, or we have a patent on this. We need to make sure it's in the right jurisdictions and, and meaningful protection and figure out how to get, get these products taken down. Uh, there are some, um, uh, some ways with Amazon that you can uh, take down a counterfeit product, an infringing product. They have their own process for uh, quickly assessing whether something is likely to be infringing and, and take it down and and typically when you have some sort of uh, uh, knockoff coming from China, they don't even respond to it. So it gets gets taken down. It's a bit like whack-a-mole, uh, but uh, uh, helps helps reduce uh, the amount of that that you see on the internet. Uh, and then there's some some more legitimate companies out there too that we're, that we're up against. Uh, in, the, uh, in the robotic space, what I found was there are... Uh, 
there are a lot of companies doing something similar. They haven't all found their their niche yet. Some of their robots are uh, something that uh, are are looking to generally solve problems, whereas others might be on a particular task for cleaning or painting or or manufacturing something. Uh, and, and they're focusing on that niche and maybe have less competition because they know that space so well. But even within those those spaces, uh, there are others that are saying, oh, we could do that and here are our capabilities and they go to the trade shows and they sell them and and uh, and then we hear, oh, we you know this person is this this company is saying they could do something similar. What do we do about it? Uh, and and we have that discussion of uh, how to approach them, uh, what to do, what not to do, uh, when to get us involved, uh, at least uh, when we should take the lead in being involved. Uh, and um, uh, and the lesson in all of it really, because because it's a case by case basis on on how we handle it. But the lesson in all of it is, if you didn't have the patent, you wouldn't have any options. You would just have to beat them flat out in the market and say, I got a better product at a better price and you need to work with us for whatever reasons. But with the patent, you have another tool in your arsenal. You have something that you can rely on, whether you're an investor saying, uh, saying, you know, if something goes wrong, uh, do we have anything to help show we're proprietary and, and, and keep those competitors away? Or if you're a uh, part of the company and you're saying, what do we do to gain that competitive edge? Uh, that pat's like an insurance policy. It's uh, it's something that that helps you protect that investment and your company, and uh, and you want it to be meaningful. You want to get meaningful protection out of it so that you could uh, you can actually use it and wave it around when when that time comes. And I think that's really appropriate for founders to hear, to hear and and actually listen. Um, I I. I know for a fact when we were doing some purchasing of some AI and ML, a big thing came in with some of the IP on the tech, who owned the code, et cetera, et cetera. But then it, it that's something that kind of hit me in the head. I was like, cool, I get that. But then I've heard some iterations from founders, which are drastically way, like, I didn't think about them, Eric. I literally didn't think like, oh, that's a thing. Oh my God, that's sinking our business. Uh, a, a founder in a startup in LA, brilliant, brilliant human being, CPG stuff, and he's got great patents on his blend. And he's got a production manufacturing in China. Well, they took his they took his blend, and they only sell it in China. And he's like, "What the? Like they literally they're his manufacturer, and they took it, and they're selling it in China." He's sitting here. He's like, "What?" <laughs> and and I I would never think. I mean, let's just I'll be very upfront and radically transparent. Like I wouldn't even think about that. Like, yeah, cool. Here's my partner, and I'm paying them and my manufacturer. And he's like, "Ross, they took my and they're selling it in China." Yeah, there's a. Uh, I, I've dealt with that situation too many times, uh, and it blindsided me, Eric. Like I was so like, "Wait, is that a thing?" <laughs> like you know, like we we don't go there. Yeah, when when so filing. Filing outside the United States, patents aren't inexpensive uh, compared to maybe the total R and D investment. It is, but the the patent itself is generally not inexpensive. It roughly, it costs about thirty thousand dollars for one patent for one invention from the day of filing through expiration. About thirty thousand, uh, and so that's over the course of twenty years. That's not and that. Sorry, that's for a like a final version of a patent, or is this a provisional? That's for filing a pat, preparing and filing a patent application, examination, uh, and maintenance fees. Industry estimate is about thirty thousand from start to finish over the course of twenty years uh, per patent. Let's say in the United States, when you start filing outside the United States, it can get pretty expensive, uh, and so it's important to figure out. Where do we really need to file? Uh, sometimes you want to think about where the competitors are. Maybe you want to think about where manufacturing is. Uh, maybe you want to think about where your key markets are. And uh, I think one important thing to remember, this isn't for the big pharma companies out there. This is for early stage companies. You don't need to be in every market. It's really expensive. 
uh, you need to be in enough places that you could control your market share. So if, uh, if you can tie up the US and Canada and Europe, uh, do you need to be in Australia, right? If, if that's the only other place they could sell it, right? just as an example. Uh, so, um, so I'd rather spend the money on getting new patents, additional patents, than than just filing it in more and more countries. It gets it just gets very expensive. We have the filing fee in those other countries, which could uh, cost like three to ten thousand dollars more, depending on uh, translations and that type of thing. Uh, then we have examination in those countries, which a lot of times they do their own examination, and we have annuities and other payments that we need to make to those patent offices. So it gets it gets pricey very quickly. Uh, with the um, with China, it's kind of the wild west. It it's still it's still evolving. It's getting better, but it's not it's not great. Uh, we've seen this issue with the uh, with the factory before, and uh, we had an instance a few years ago with um, a, a consumer product that uh, that was patented in the U.S. Uh, there were a few patent applications pending in the U.S. There was a uh, patent application uh, in China as well, and we didn't. We came in after all these things were filed, but we didn't. Our, the the company didn't file the Chinese patent application. The factory did. Well, the interesting thing about that is it doesn't even list the right inventors because the people at the factory in China didn't actually invent it. And so once you clean all that up and say, all right, that's really our patent, and uh, and then try to tie that into the rest of the patent family and petition the patent office and say, we're so sorry, sorry to come about this late, uh, but this is, you know, let's change the inventors on this and change the title, and it's really uh, part of the family here. Uh, well, that claim, that, that, Chinese application was actually filed before the US application was. Now, the added wrinkle we had was uh, in the United States and in, and in other countries, when you file, uh, when you want to file outside that country first, if you have US inventors and you want to file outside the United States first, you need to get permission from the US government. If you're in another country like India and you want to, uh, whether it's uh, an Indian company or an Indian inventor, and you want to file in a different country first, uh, oftentimes we have Indian inventors, uh, we need to go to the Indian government and say, hey, we want to file this as a patent application, give us a foreign filing license to do so. Without a foreign filing license, uh, you can get a fine, you could go to jail, uh, or uh, your patent can be held unenforceable. So never seen anyone go to jail over it. Uh, but but some serious issues can result from not getting that foreign fine license. So so we take that very seriously. Uh, in this case, we had we were basically saying, hey, it was filed outside the United States first without getting that foreign fine license. And then clear of that issue too. It becomes really hairy, and uh, and so that the best thing we we can advise to avoid these situations is is file early, file in the jurisdictions that matter. And we can head off. We can head off all of these issues. Um, Narrow your focus by having a conversation. And it all right. starts with, and and I think one thing a lot of founders and and this is something we teach our um, incubator and accelerator uh, kind of participants that you know you have an advantage when you're early that most whether it's a boutique firm or whether it's a large firm or a behemoth firm. They have people who are more than willing to spend time and, and speak to uh, founders, yeah. whether it's still an idea or if they have a full-fledged business. Um, and just reaching out to people either on LinkedIn or through the website or through their profile page, it's it's not very difficult. And in <laughs> most cases, you'll get a free one-hour consult. That's right. I, I think it's really important. Like You, you brought in some stuff about the un uh, unenforceability and whatnot. I think it's really important for finders to know, uh, you don't know about me, Eric, but I had a, a huge black mark. Uh, I didn't, I had a black mark in my hedge fund because I set it up wrong. When I was 19, wet behind the ears, 12 years earlier, you know, I trusted some people, I trusted lawyers, I trusted our PPM, our auditor, blah, blah, blah. And it didn't exactly, 
it didn't cross all the T's and I's and all the back problems I didn't think about. So now let's just see, cool. I had my IP and I've been doing sales for seven years and like, holy shit, they just saying it's unenforceable. Like how damaging could that really be? I mean, okay, founder, you have to pay us back seven years worth of revenue, interest, legal, like you take a step back and you're like, I just got crushed and you didn't really think of the consequences. Right. And I'm sure it could get that bad or am I, am I being a, a worry work? No, no, it, it can be bad. I mean, it, what happens with the way it typically plays out is, is you do something wrong and, uh, and then you go to enforce it against the competitor. And if you get the, the right patent attorney, they're going to, they're going to look for warts before asserting it. They're going to say, hold on, like this patent you got doesn't, doesn't stand up. Here are the right. issues with it that right. they are going to be able to win or even worse, your competitor pokes those holes in it. Uh, and, and sometimes you even have to pay their fees for it. Uh, we, we've even, um, so I work closely with a few colleagues that focus on uh, data rights and, and technology licensing. And there are a lot of, a lot of attorneys out there, not just IP attorneys, but a lot of attorneys take that work for granted. Uh, they don't do a lot of it. They think they're good at it. And when I work with my team members that do on a regular basis, I can really appreciate how good they are at it. But one of the things, one of the issues that's evolved uh, is that AI licensing, for instance, or data licensing is not the same animal that it was a few years ago. It can't be. It can't be. You, it just you, can't be. You can't use your license, your template from 20 years ago for a, a widget for for AI. And you know, it doesn't address who owns the model, who owns the trained model, who owns the data going in, who owns the data coming out, what do we get to do with it? What if this relationship falls apart? Who owns what? Uh, and those are the types of issues that when we have that discussion, even explore patentability, uh, we'll explore those as well. Uh, yeah. you know, put red flags on those. Those are things we need to follow up on. Uh, oh, you have this relationship with a you want to have this relationship with customers? Well, well, let's make sure you have the right agreement for that, the right terms and conditions for that. Uh, and, and here's where they're probably going to push back on that, especially as these companies get bigger and more sophisticated. It's just so apropos, Seth. We, we got to megaphone this because he also brings up another point about T's and C's and policies and just little things that we don't think about. Eric, we got, we got shut by, um, our marketplace got shut by Apple. Um, and maybe I'm 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 100% butchering this, but I think Apple brought in this new policy where on marketplaces or I don't know, like you almost you almost have to have it that the person doesn't have to log in before they see what you're selling or or some like iteration of a policy that the app store is like, nope, your app is no longer like allowed. We're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because because you're saying the user has to log in before they can see what they want to buy. And I was like, yeah, it's a subscription membership. Yeah, yeah, we don't care. And I was like. So they, they shut us. And I'm like, what? Like, where is reality with you douchebags? And it was like overnight. And we just had no idea. So like, let's be, let's call a spade a spade. That's three weeks down of revenue. That's, you, you know, that's just us grabbing our butts and puckering them. And because it's out of nowhere. It's out of nowhere. And not only it's out of nowhere, there probably isn't a precedent to deal with the, the situation that comes out of nowhere. Like, what is the answer to this problem that they just put on us? Right. Right. And so and so for those types of situations, it's great to have at least the phone number of a lawyer where you could pick up the phone and say, <laughs> yes. have you dealt with this? How do we how do we straighten this issue out? Or it was brutal. It was really brutal. Even even better, having someone who counsels you in a way that you never have to deal with that situation oh eric if i knew you a few years ago <laughs> my dude no, actually I'd, I'd love to to get a sense of this because like so when i, I you imagine... were jackass yeah i messed up <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> when i could when i think about like good big law, law firms right because you have so many professionals working in very specialized fields as well um who are very open to communicating and collaborating with each other, right? I imagine it to be the just this crazy Slack group, just of your own firm, where you wow. can, you know, ping out like, "Hey, I'm dealing with this scenario. Like, can somebody help me?" 
is it like that or do you guys have some other process for uh collaborating with let's say somebody in a different office in a different country uh who could help you answer your question so so the it it does happen like that sometimes, and there are there are a few different ways that it it comes it comes up. Uh, there are times when someone might send an email to the whole firm, or to uh, a message to a certain practice group, and say, "Who's ever dealt with this type of issue?" And you'll get either flooded with emails saying, "You know, go to this person," or or a bunch of people volunteering. Uh, I've even done it for for. Uh, proposals were, you know, I can read through everyone's bio, but it doesn't necessarily convey everyone's technological experience. And I'll say, who has experience with this type of technology? And I'll get a dozen emails back saying, oh, I got a PhD in that. And I got, uh, you know, I, I studied that in college or that was my first job out of college. And and so I could put a nice uh, proposal together. Uh, there are other instances where we have more focused groups and you can, and you know kind of who to go to. If you don't already have a go-to person, you kind of know who to, you could go to that that smaller group. Um, we have a uh, uh, a group we actually met uh, earlier today. Uh, we meet on a regular basis to talk about uh, NFTs and uh, Web3 uh, and uh, uh, crypto type type issues. And, uh, and it's, it's, SEC lawyers and trademark lawyers and patent attorneys uh, and crypto lawyers. And and we have people coming at from all different angles, uh, people from the sports industry uh, on that as well. And and we talk about some issues that we're seeing, opportunities that we're seeing. Uh, we're all dealing with different types of clients from different types of angles. Uh, but when when I see, uh, you know, one of my contacts, one of my clients has uh, that I'm helping with with IP issues has a uh, an SEC related issue. I know who from my group handles SEC issues uh, involving crypto, so I know I know I know to go to that person. Uh, and and so the way our firm is broken down, we have practice areas, which is just a conventional way of saying IP attorney, corporate attorney, litigator, right? And those types of buckets are are more for organizational purposes, uh, though sometimes. Uh, there's a development in the law, and we'll get together and, and talk about how to how to overcome that uh, and how to address it. But uh, but we also have uh, a sector focus because our clients don't align with practice groups; uh, they align with sectors and, and industries. So so we'll have uh, we have a healthcare industry, for instance, and uh, we have a. Um, uh, an innovative technology one. We also have uh, manufacturing too. And, and and within those, we have subgroups, like ones that focus on artificial intelligence and uh, ones that focus on medical devices. And so if you need that type of expertise, you know who to go to. Uh, they're constantly pumping out thought leadership, uh, content to read on the website or LinkedIn or whatever it is. And uh, uh, and they're they're on top of the cutting edge issues so that you know uh, oh, these are the people I need to go to with this opportunity. There's someone there that can that can help me. Uh, I'm involved in in a few of them as my practice kind of spreads across, and the clients are in all different different spaces. Uh, but it's it's nice to see when you have that kind of depth. Uh, oh, this is a, a specific type of healthcare AI licensing issue. Great, I have a team of people that I know I could go to to. To deal with that issue and 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 get them on the phone to to talk to the client. So um, so the organization makes it easier than just you know the the random blast. Who knows how to do this? Uh, it, it's a little more focused on that usually. That that must be a fun uh, weekly kind of committee to be a part of, just seeing updated. Yeah, there are some interesting uh, discussions there. We also have hey, people are coming into the office more these days. Uh, the the offices that, that are closest to mine happen to be our uh, corporate lawyers and and venture capital lawyers. So, uh, you know, occasional hallway conversations. Hey, what do you think about this? Have you seen this type of situation? Uh, we had a client the other day who um, uh, had to dissolve and, and dealing with issues of uh, how do we move the patents to a new entity? after dissolution and uh and that's a bit out of my wheelhouse 
uh, because all my companies are usually thriving. Uh, so, <laughs> <Mic drop. laughs> so I had to get the, uh, had to get some of them involved to say, what do, what do I do here? What kind of advice do I give for, for, uh, for how to move these patents? So uh, the hallway discussion, you know, the proverbial water cooler type discussions are, are valuable too. It's not just, uh, it's not just us focusing on our particular niche in our, in a vacuum. Um, we're trying to seek guidance and, and give that well-rounded uh, counseling to our clients whenever we can. Yeah, I'm, I bet your VC um, wing is also pretty active because uh, you guys work across the entire spectrum too. Yeah, they they work um, they work on all different size companies. Uh, the last couple of years have been real gangbusters for them. They're going they're going nuts with. Uh, uh, with what's going on, and then, um, and then, even when there's when there are challenges, they're they're still busy uh, helping to to counsel their clients. Sometimes it's a bit more challenging to get funding uh, in certain periods, but uh, but still still a need for them. And thankfully, with our economy uh, and um, and the innovative spirit that we have here, there's still a ton of early stage companies looking to get out there and and make something new and and bring something different to society yeah um, a lot of people actually consider these kinds of times to build the best companies so if you're hearing this give it a shot too um, and again i think that's just so it's so poignant for people to understand great the valuations were just puffed i mean when you're not profitable and you're valued at nine billion like what do i miss these days i just don't get it yeah i and I represent clients of all different sizes, so I'm not gonna. Oh, I'm, sorry. I mean, yeah, no, no, that makes total <laughs> sense to me I, because I'm smart. I, I think I there are one of the things I've been fortunate enough to see is is startup culture across the country, and it is different in each oh, that's cool. community. So, really? so like Silicon Valley is a lot different than let's say, um, uh. Utah, New Orleans, or DC, or um, uh, or Pittsburgh. Uh, there are those are they're great. They're all great communities. Even Toronto, I've I've seen quite a bit uh, throughout Canada. Uh, there are there are great communities. Uh, some of them, I think, focus more on uh, technology than others. Uh, some focus on uh, on things that are are maybe uh, rooted in in what that city has to offer. So if that city has a whole bunch of universities and a whole bunch of tech companies, then oftentimes we see a lot more technology coming out of it. If it's uh, uh, maybe more of a uh, tourist type city, maybe we see uh, things that are um, uh, maybe geared towards entertainment or uh, more social networking type innovations about getting people together uh, or supporting uh, that type of industry. And so, um, but the but the funding in those places uh, is really quite different, right? It, Silicon Valley is kind of its, its own thing, but uh, in some of these places, they have some very real technology, some great opportunities, uh, but but there's just not a lot of funding there. They don't get a lot of the attention because they're, they're not in a major market. Uh, in some of these other places, there aren't enough substantial uh, startups, ones that that could be um, that could really hit big, uh, that that it really even attracts the investors. So the other the other one, so the the companies there don't get the attention that they that they might deserve as much as those accelerators and incubators really try they they can't pull the the attention there uh so it it's kind of sad actually to to see some of these places where where they have great ideas but it's so hard to get to get money uh and so uh um you know we do our best to make introductions uh to investors we know and and say hey this is this is someone who's not in your network or in your region but someone you might want to uh you might want to consider we also have a uh, um, uh, a group within the firm where we post the pitch decks and and say, hey, this is 
this is a company that's looking for X number of dollars, someone to do this with the company, uh, who's got a lead that might be interested. And that at that time that can oftentimes lead to uh, uh, a worthwhile introduction that they otherwise wouldn't have had. I think both Raj and I have both uh, kind of lived through those experiences where our our law firms um, have made those introductions with early stage angels or or VCs um, to just you know get to know one another. Yeah, the the law firms I think. I think my guidance out there would be use them, uh, use them as a as a tool, you know, for what you need and see see if they know what kind of introductions they can make, uh, you know, and explore how they can help protect you. Uh, you don't have to move forward on every project, but help them issue spot and see what it would take to uh, to resolve those issues and and or head off those issues and understand uh, the risk. I think one of the uh, one of the things I like about uh, Foley is is I haven't found that our uh, our VC lawyers, our startup lawyers, are playing a numbers game. Uh, there are there are a few firms out there with great reputations for dealing with startup companies, but I find that uh, it's a it's a volume game for them. They're trying to get as many as they can, and and they know a few of them will hit it big, and that'll make up for the the ones that are that our are. Rule. Um, from and, working with too many VCs, <laughs> and and I think I think what I found is my colleagues are spending the time to treat everyone like like they're the next big one and give them the attention that that they actually deserve, uh, and maybe that's what it takes for them to to hit it big. But they'll all get the partner's attention, and and they'll all get uh, they'll all get that phone call and and um, and meaningful work product, and not just the off the shelf. Uh, you know, here's the package that that everyone gets, and uh, and if you hit it big, you know, remember us. Yeah, and that that's super interesting too, because like that approach, I think, escapes a lot of people in that understanding. Because uh, especially when it comes to we talk to the different geos, that's bespoke. It, it's really important for them to know. Hey, listen, Seattle's top down due diligence, Silicon Valley might be bottoms up. Understand the investor base is different. You mentioned New Orleans. I was in New Orleans for an extended period of time. And that was like, that's my home. And there's brilliance over there, but it's a dumpster fire. And, and why is that? Like, what's, what is that? Like, well, what's that barrier? Is it just a stigma? Like we got to be here. And, 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 and I, the only reason I'd push back is not on you, of course, but just the stigma of like, well, again, Salt Lake turned into Silicon Slopes really, really, really quickly. So stop with this bullshit of you have to be in Cali on, on you know, uh, on, on next to Apple. Yeah, so so New Orleans is is interesting, and uh, and there are some some great companies that came out of there, and, and I work with a few great companies in in New Orleans. Uh, the um, I, I don't think it's until recently that Tulane had uh, computer science uh, division, a uh, computer science major there. Uh, there there hasn't been a lot of tech majors that come out of the schools and stay there. Uh, I think you have a lot of Northeastern U.S. Uh, born students going there and and returning home after after they study. Not a lot, not a lot of people sticking around uh, afterwards, and it's a big a big tourist destination. Uh, but uh, and and there are there are a handful of great incubators there and accelerators. Uh, I I've seen some great uh, some great. Innovations coming out of the biotechnology center there, uh, but as far as non-biotech innovations, uh, I'd love to see more critical mass, and then I think you get the attention of of more investors saying uh, it's worth adding this to our our geographic region that we're gonna we're gonna focus on. So, Seth, like I will, I'll call a spade a spade, and I'll backtrack when my foot is in my mouth. Um, Actually, that's totally that totally makes sense, Eric. And it there's a great reframe, uh, only because and, and Seth, you might not know, Tulane is actually the number one employer in the city. So if the number one employer of a city is a college, it's most likely a college town. I mean, a destination place like I say, like there is some brilliant people from you know New York and whatnot, but they get their degree and they leave. So that that does make a lot of sense. Uh, that and Oshner, the hospital systems, but outside of that, it's really just the universities and number one 
And if the number one, you know, again, employer is, a, is an educational system, you're probably not there for accelerators in tech. Right. Like, like Los Angeles has some great tech companies, but Los Angeles isn't a big tech hub either. Uh, there are many places that rank higher than, than Los Angeles. There's so much focusing on, on entertainment. And I think, yeah. I think New Orleans is kind of like, kind of like Los Angeles in that there's, there's movies being filmed there. There's, there's music, great music, but, uh, um, for technology, it's just not, not what you think of as, as the place to be. That's just, that's just funny because I just remember after Katrina, like all we saw was like, just a bunch of Nicolas Cage movies being like shot. I'm like what the fuck is going on? Like, why is anybody coming <laughs> to New Orleans? So Seth, uh, New Orleans, just to attract people coming back, uh, massive, massive ab tax abatements when it comes to media and, and right. movies. So, so I'm over here and I'm like, great, another shitty Nicolas Cage movie coming out of New Orleans. <laughs> sorry, Nick Cage. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, Nick Cage. Yeah. No, even actually, that's an interesting point with the universities, right? And I'm surprised Tulane didn't get, uh, as the number one employer, like, a lot of universities figured out early on to join the startup bandwagon. And I can say this because, you know, I that's kind of what I did as a as a fresh grad. I saw that nobody was doing it, so I just started it and was lucky. You know, that's like university. That's that's really smart and really stupid. And I should probably reach out to be completely honest. Because I like when I went to the A. B. Freeman School of Business, that was shit, more than 20 years ago. Um, we didn't have it, but we had the, like the Birkin Rose project. I think you probably have like a theoretical portfolio and a theoretical company. Yeah. You invest a million bucks and you present blah, blah, blah. Like they do push it in. That's a really interesting part. But again, I think it might go into what Eric is saying about it's not a big tech hub. So what's the point of an accelerator? And even with a university, but that is, they have a deep business acumen, a maritime law and, and shit like that. But uh, Napoleonic Co. Blah, blah, blah. But uh, that is interesting. But then again, what, what Eric was saying, I, I wouldn't think they put Accelerator in a kind of a dead space for tech. No, no, there are a lot of students uh, and recent graduates that that work with universities, and and we represent them, and we represent universities, uh, and it's tricky working with universities. Uh, so, uh, in some instances, the university owns the foundational IP, and Oftentimes they will not sell it to the company under. Got it. Reasons. Got it. And if they were doing research on site in the clinics and shit like that. Yeah, and and so you want to start a company, you want to own it, and they'll, they'll say, "Oh, we yeah. have exclusive license, okay. but we get a portion okay. of all your company's revenue." And yeah. um, the, it's a, again another instance where you know reach out to the lawyer, explore it before it's too late, uh, and especially before you have that contract. With some undergrads, you're not necessarily required to give the IP to the university. Depends on the circumstance. Uh, graduate students and faculty usually have to. They usually sign their rights over as a condition of employment. Uh, uh, but even then, uh, you might be able to negotiate. You just think as a early stage company with mm -hmm. no revenue and no business, uh, you're working with the uh, with the. Uh, commercialization, the technology transfer department of university, their job is to identify IP that they can commercialize. You have uh, very little uh, to no leverage with them. So there's not much, there's not much you could do. Um, David and David and Goliath. Right, right. But we still try to explore those opportunities, negotiate, see what we could see what we could do if there are any carve outs uh, to give you some, uh, some, some better, um, some some better prospects there but but at least going into it eyes wide open of of here's what it's going to look like and uh and how to work around it if if that's truly an issue you guys are frat brothers and and you were S, uh you were san jose right yeah. Seth? and then you did the incubator with the college yeah so uh, it started as a meetup group so because i was yeah. part of the fraternity and i used to crash on the couch like for up to Thing, like two or three years afterwards because you know press no, grad not crashing so no, that is no sir no that's homeless that is not hey, crashing yeah they that's they like, would be partying all around me no no yeah you were homeless 
Hey, bro, can I couch surf? going to say two or three days, like a week. Yeah, I can, can but, I couch uh, surf two or three It years. wasn't, no, no, no. I, I wasn't there continuously. This would be like every weekend or every other weekend. You know, whenever I'd be in town. No, because <laughs> it home makes was me think right now is like, yeah, with what you and Eric are saying, I'm going to pick up the phone and call Tulane and be like, hey, listen, Tulane alum, Accelerator, I'm going to set up an incubation. See what they say. <laughs> Uh, so I, but for mine, it was just uh, uh, having the fraternity lock me a room every every other week, and I would just you know use LinkedIn re re uh, really to mm -hmm. message people, organize the speakers, and then be like, hey, there are these three people coming in, and then any founder kind of community, student groups and stuff that I would find, I would just invite them. I like it. Yeah, eventually, this this uh, so silly San Jose gave us uh, space in downtown, um, and it was all free and paid for. And then uh, uh, San Jose State University, at the time, they were building a new student union, and they had dedicated a room called Spartups. But then when we shut down, it just kind of went up in the air. But yeah, it was a good four four and a half years of a, a good partnership with them. Yeah, so, I give. I give a lot of um, uh, mentorship and guidance to early stage companies that I don't even work with uh, through their Canadian accelerators. Uh, there are accelerators in New York and DC that I work with uh, where I'll occasionally go in and, and speak uh, and then hold office hours just to chat about uh, what they're doing and, and the opportunities and, and issues there. Uh, love just talking about it, hearing about it. So, uh, so it, it keeps me, keeps me going. Cause I find it interesting, uh, and, and they get some value out of it. So, um, you know, like for those that aren't in the accelerators, uh, you know, think about it as a, as a useful resource to, to get things going, uh, make some connections, maybe get some funding, get some mentorship. Uh, there's plenty of people, uh, including all the speakers here that are willing to act as a mentor. Uh, so reach out to those and, uh, and make use of it. And that's actually a, a great plug for us with the with the concierge, what we call it, is um, you know. And Eric, you've seen a lot of these communities and these incubators, accelerators over the years, the good ones and the bad ones. Um, and the the takeaway that I took away was that a lot of the good ones will have a very easy uh, way for their portfolio, their founders, to just ask for help. And that's what we're trying to build with our concierge, which is. It's either myself or Raj with our experience in our, our past lives as founders and as VCs um, to be able to just get some sense of who you should talk to. We uh, or I don't consider myself very successful. Raj is uh, uh, way past mine, uh, way past myself. But, you know, to be able to get our perspective and be like, listen, you need to talk to Eric. And guess what? Eric has told us that he loves uh, or he fits in these kinds of spaces, or if it's the right fit. And if it is, we'll make that intro. And you know, uh, uh, what, the way we act uh, as is not even a filter, really, because we haven't really had to say no to anybody yet. But more so just saying, these are people that we've worked with in the past in different capacities, or these are our friends. So just go and speak to him, just like you would uh, you know, one of your own. So we do. Yeah, even even the the serial entrepreneurs that I meet uh, that have been at this at this for a while, uh, just because they've done it that way in the past, uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way moving forward. Uh, it could be a different corporate structure, different scenario with other founders, different technology. Uh, you know, I was talking earlier about uh, how the how the patent laws have have evolved over the years. Uh, something that might have been really easy. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, might be treated a lot differently now. So good to get, uh, you know, additional views and, and hear another perspective on things, even if you think you have a, a great network already. And as a, as an advisor, right. And you, you mentioned this earlier, but having, uh, somebody, uh, represent you and who has not only your interest, but also the company's interest, right. I think that's a very important lens a lot of founders need to realize is that you need a professional partner like that who can scold you when necessary, but then also guide you or assist you or be that, that, um, that just, just a, not even, not a friend, but be that confidant, that conciliary 
I guess, from uh, uh, from the Godfather, right? Right. Um, who Definitely knows a, all a the technology here? <laughs> but you know, you have to. So, and, but um, you know, just, just being able to communicate, um, being able to reach out to somebody, and then know that once you tell them what the what the problem is. They have their own process. They have their own network of people that they can activate on the fly and get it done for you. Uh, I, I will say when you hire a lawyer, when a startup company hires a lawyer, the client is the startup company. Uh, it is not each individual. You know, they might have their own employment issues, whatever that is. And, and there's times we can deal with that, too. But but we are trying to do what's best for the company. Uh People will come and go, uh, and uh, and we like to think everything's going to be rosy, happy times. But we're there for the for the times that that they aren't. Uh, I mean, of course, with fundraising and other things, those are quite happy times too that we're there. But but you know, when when there's trade secret theft or uh, an employee goes to start a competing company or something like that, uh, we're there to represent the company and not any particular individual and, and help do what's best, not only to avoid those issues, but but to uh, to help work work out those issues and, and resolve them. Uh, so so we will counsel you through problems. Uh, but but the lens we're looking at is usually the through through the eyes of what's best for the company, not necessarily the individual that that called us and said, you know, help me through this. It's uh, uh, if if there are competing interests, we're in it for the company. That's a great, great reminder. Yeah, you kind of have to be because the company doesn't have emotions. It's like, okay, I might lose my job, Eric. Like, you got to help me out. Like, nope, nope. It's hard. tough. So what, what are you most excited about these days? Or like, um, you know, we're, we're moving so fast in terms of AI. And one point, actually... I heard over the weekend that uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI has started sending um, trademark notices to companies who have GPT in their name, uh, which I, I think really comes down into what you're talking about. You know, just talk to somebody like you uh, to see where these potential kind of triggers are that you can either get away with or that you need to at least be aware of and, and address. Yeah, so so with regard to the name, I work with a whole bunch of great trademark experts, and and it's also a good idea to get them involved early. Uh, it it doesn't seem to be high cost when you do it early enough. Uh, the the cost seems to me, in my experience, come when you start using your company name and find out too late that it's already being used by by someone, and uh, and they don't want you to use it anymore. And you say, wait a minute, I've done all this branding work already, uh, and now I have to change it. So another thing that could have been taken care of uh, a few years back uh, or a few months back so uh, and saved you a lot of time and money. So if you're unsure what the company name should be, you have a few options. Let's run them all down and, and see which one is is has the most room for uh, for protection in, in the space you want to you want to live in. Uh, we've seen a lot from the chat GPT type space uh, in numerous angles. One is uh, companies now thinking more about generative AI and how they can protect things, uh, which um, uh, isn't necessarily all that new, uh, but the capabilities of it are so much better. And they're realizing they don't have to necessarily build it themselves. Addresses some other licensing issues uh as to who owns what uh also uh means lately we've been dealing with a lot of company policies uh helping them put the policy in place to say employees can do this or shouldn't do this uh for instance we guide people not to uh type in their trade secrets uh into chat gpt <laughs> don't type in your ip into chat gpt <laughs> uh, i want to give give those things away they're um you know, when when we have some sort of open model that that you're putting your data into, uh, it can be used by others. It can be used by the entity that's that's hosting that model, and uh, you can't necessarily trust or even understand yet how how that could be used 
uh, in the future, but you don't want to lose your rights to it or your confidentiality of it. So, uh, so those are some of the things that, uh, that we advise on. Uh, but yeah, a lot of companies are using generative AI now and exploring how that can, can help their, uh, their business. There's certainly a ton of, uh, patentability in, in that space. It's a, it's a, um, wide open area that are, that people are racing to try to, uh, figure out how to customize, um, images or sound or text from, uh, uh, from those type of those types of engines, we're also seeing um, opportunities to uh, help our job. So, so a lawyer using uh, some sort of AI platform as a tool to make our job easier. Now, uh, we've evaluated some. We continue to evaluate them. I haven't seen any yet that I think are ready for prime time that are that I'm going to use to replace what I do. Uh, there's a, um, th these machines can learn very quickly, but, uh, they're not at the point yet, I think, where they understand, uh, the type of guidance that we're giving and, uh, no, you know, writing a patent application, for instance, uh, there are a few things we want to consider, uh, about, um, eligibility and arguments that the, uh, text that the examiner is going to be looking for and, uh, different alternatives that we're going to want to make sure we discuss and, uh, uh, and, and writing styles. And yeah, a machine could be trained eventually to do that. And maybe it'll be in six months or a year or five years or 10 years. I'm not really sure. But right now I haven't found that those tools are, are ready and, and available to be uh, replacing any of us yet. Uh, I think if you have an eighth grader who who wants to do a book report, it's a good starting point, uh, but it's not um, uh, it's not something I'd rely on for uh, as a replacement for the the work product that we provide yet. Makes sense. Anywhere close? There are <laughs> there are some practices that have very repetitive type yeah. uh, innovations. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a there's a company that's been around for a while that's a few years, at least maybe five years or so doing uh, patent drafting with AI. And uh, I've spoken to them a few times and they're great people and they have pretty good work product. Uh, but they, they've even admitted to me, uh, this is meant for the type of entity that uh, is, uh, let's say a telecom company and you, uh, you have mostly the same figures in every application and you, uh, tweak one little thing here, uh, and, uh, it's a known component, but you're, but you're changing the arrangement of it, the configuration of it. Uh, and so it's just a rearrangement of text and, and adding a, an additional paragraph or two. So that's not true AI. It, well, it's AI in that it'll, it'll fill out the details of, of what you have in the figures. Uh, but, but if you need to write a customized application that right. spoke patent application each time, uh, it's not going to, it's probably not going to do enough that it's, uh, uh, it's really meaningful. It might save, Thanks. might save an hour or two. Yeah. Uh, that could be helpful, but, uh, but, but probably not enough at this point that it, it's going to be a considerable, uh, cost difference you know we we have um the the cost of a patent application hasn't really changed in the industry throughout my whole career which is crazy because you know inflation's hitting everything else but but for some reason patent applications are kind of staying around this the same cost uh, forget about billable rates and that type of thing because we focus so much on on estimates or fixed fee amounts for patent applications so it's generally generally been about the same, but technology is getting so much more complex than it used to be, and the law is getting so much more uh, complex. Where there are so many more considerations we need to think about now than we used to back then, uh, because as the law evolves and they say, well, you can't do this, and you should do this, and you should think about this and not this, uh, then um, then we have to put more time and effort into it, and and that complexity is increasing. Uh, and it's probably increasing just as fast as the the tools are 
uh, that'll help save us time. So it's not really um, it's not really at a point yet, I think, where the software tools make things uh, so much more efficient that it could really drive down drive down costs. Uh, some of my colleagues have have told me they've they've read excerpts of of patents written by AI and and they say you could totally tell and uh, and it's not the way they would have done it. Uh, and yes, it could be trained, but uh, I'm focusing right now on training my my junior team members uh, and and not the not the software. Maybe one day, but uh, but not today. That will be interesting, though, when the LMS systems and the onboarding go through AI, which I'm sure is close. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're getting close. Uh, it, you know, I think, I think it's dominating. It's going to be dominating uh, more than we, more than we've ever envisioned in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Though I was at a, a healthcare conference, healthcare technology conference a few weeks ago, uh, and there were there were a whole bunch of booths there, a few thousand attendees, and at all these booths, I wouldn't say all of them, there were a lot of booths that said like, we use AI, an AI platform to do whatever it is, and we start digging into it, and we're like, you're not really doing AI, you have software. Software is not necessarily AI. It's uh, uh, there's nothing intelligent about what you're doing. Yes, it's it's doing something that maybe you don't think has been done before, and you had to write it. But uh, um, there's a difference between AI and, and API. Uh, you, you, you know, there's no machine learning. You didn't even have to train this. It's just uh, it's just an algorithm or a decision tree. So, I think I you know we've seen this this issue of people using that term AI a lot in their branding. Uh, and and we knew a lot of it wasn't AI. But now I think there's this explosion of even more companies leveraging AI and uh, and saying it's AI or using chat GPT uh, and, and putting your information into that. I think it's even more critical now than ever that when you partner with someone, or especially if you're claiming to be that person, uh, that's using the AI. Uh, are you uh, protecting what's yours? You're protecting your customers' information. Uh, are you uh, protecting any innovations you have? Uh, and uh, uh, the the issues aren't aren't as black and white as they as they used to be, uh, and and much more much more complicated. So uh, it's a fascinating world for for IP lawyers and technology lawyers, and and we're happy about it. Um, I don't think it's replacing anyone's anyone's job just yet, but uh, but we'll have some interesting conversations down the road. So Eric, like we have a couple minutes left uh, until the episode, uh, end of the episode, but you're in one of those unique positions where you see a lot of you know, entrepreneurs like successes as well as failures. Any patterns that you've seen, like? Uh, from the people that you work with in terms of what are the lessons that they've taken away from failure because everybody goes through it. Uh, so, so I think the a couple observations. Uh, one is uh, there are there are too many instances where we see someone getting a patent application that filed that doesn't know the patent attorney doesn't really know the technology doesn't really know the industry and uh doesn't really know how to pursue adequate protection and it's such a shame because it's hard to salvage some of those situations uh and uh, no one wants to deal with a malpractice fight or accusations or anything like that we just want to move on and 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 protect their rights and and so um, I think it's important to ask those questions about experience with that type of technology and experience with those industries and and know you're getting the right uh, counselor, the right attorney to to deal with it from the beginning. Uh, and um, we've just seen too many instances where where they start with someone and then they come to us and and we try to revive it, try to uh, either file new applications or um, 
or clean up the old ones uh, the best we can. Uh, and and they they inevitably say, oh, I wish I wish we had come to you earlier uh, to to do this. And so, if there's something you're unsure about uh, with this patent lawyer, or it seems too good to be true, and they're they're going to do it for next to nothing, and uh, and write some amazing patent application, or, or you read it and you say, well, this just sounds a lot like my marketing materials, or or I read this and this doesn't sound at all like my invention. Uh, ask some questions and and walk through it, or or get a second opinion on it. Uh, another thing I've noticed, not so much from the patent perspective, is there are different roles within each company, and I've seen this in large and small companies. Uh, there are some people that are start the company, they're the CEO uh, and or the CTO, but that's not really where they belong. And there's no one really there to tell them that. And when you talk to the investors, the investors see it immediately. They say, we like this company. That's not our CEO, though. Or we like this company, but, but we're going to have to put in a new CTO. And... Uh, a poor person's a founder and thinking I came up with this technology and and I want to I want to run the show here, but it's not really the right role for them. And uh, uh, I think that sometimes hampers their ability to grow the company, uh, to get the right funding, to get revenue going. Uh, it's it's not just a personality issue that can be trained or that that we can work out down the road. Uh, there's too many instances where the wrong leadership is in place from the beginning. And so I would encourage having that discussion upfront about, about goals uh, and who's who has certain strengths and who has certain weaknesses and fill those weaknesses with with other people. Uh, and and that's one way to, to overcome it. But you know, let's not force someone in the CEO position who's not really a CEO. Let's not force someone into a CTO position of a software company that doesn't really know much about software. Uh, and uh, you know, the founders are gonna are gonna see red flags there. Uh, and um, you know, we we had a um, we had a startup company a few years ago where the CTO. Uh, was one of the founders and came to us and said, I have this, I have this great idea. And we said, that's an interesting idea. And, and like all patent applications, we, we ask a lot of what ifs, could we do this? Could we do this? You know, what if the software worked this way? And one of my team members presented uh, a scenario to him. What if the software worked like this? And he said, I like that. Scrap everything I said and let's do it. Your way. And we thought, as the CTO, like we just we're just spitballing here. Yep. And uh, uh, and he's willing to abandon everything he's been working on for however many months to just go with with this idea off the top of our head. So we kind of knew from there this company was going to last long, and guess what? It it didn't. Uh, so um, I, I just don't think he was the right person to be in that in that CTO position. He was probably someone who was better for uh, fundraising or maybe operations, but from a technology perspective, he wasn't, wasn't the right person. And so, uh, so I, I love when I, when I meet the company's founders and you get a, you get a sense of who's in which position. And sometimes it's just so clear, yes, this is the CEO and this is the CTO and, and the other uh, C-suite execs. And, and it just all makes sense to you. Uh, there's times when it doesn't feel right, and and I would encourage some discussions to to talk through that because because it really does affect the company's success. Thank you so much, Eric. This was a lot of fun. Um, so how can our viewers find you uh, if they want to reach out? So LinkedIn, of course, is is one way to do it. Uh, you can also find me uh, on our website, which is www.foley.com. F O L E Y. Uh, you can email me. Uh, esofer at foley.com e-s-o-p-h-i-r at foley.com or give me a call 202-295-4149 and uh uh not going to charge you for that uh 
for that phone call or or few emails or something, you know, well, I'll let you know when uh, when we get started on that and, and give you some expectations of what that's going to cost. But let's chat and and talk about uh talk about the opportunity and 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 give you some guidance as to what uh what the next step should be. Raj, any final question? No, I think it's just so important. Pick up the phone and call them. I, I mean, I have slammed my appendage in the door so many times, you know, and the little things, they just, they sniper you. They sniper you and, and that's it. That is it. That is just unequivocally it. And you're like, oh, that sucked. And th this is the game. It's a startup. Like, I don't know how many founders are like, cool, I'm with a big corporate, you know, foundation behind me. It's like, nope, I'm in my mom's basement so let me tie all these shoestrings together to make it work. Oh shit! I just generated twenty k and and whatever widget I'm selling. I'm a company. Like yeah, like no, you put band aids and duct tape together with bubble gum. So and I think uh, a a hack right and and there's some really good nuggets in this episode where Eric you were able to describe some of the hacks that you use as a lawyer and similarly. One of the reasons why I started the accelerator in the first place was to be able to get the door open with large firms or, you know, bigger brand firms, because I knew the people that are working there are there for a reason. Right? Yeah. They, they've had those wins. They have their their networks. They have people that they respect and are respected with to be able to open doors if they filter you. Right. That That's it's kind of the process. So why wouldn't you want to get? try to find the best people to work with and have them vouch for you. Um, it's it's a major morale boost. It's, it's just an accelerator in itself. And now I think the, the, the newer evolution of law firms is that we can handle multiple aspects. So as you grow, we can grow your, with you. But then any other scenario that can come up, there's somebody, whether it's a potential customer, it's a potential investor, it's some other stakeholder, that I feel a, a good lawyer, a great CFO are hidden superpowers for any good startup or any good company. Yeah, I was giving the analogy earlier to to uh, IP is almost like an insurance policy for your your investment, but but think about it like like your healthcare. Uh, this is the healthcare of your company. Uh, you don't need a a doctor for the healthcare of your company. You need lawyers to. Uh, prevent problems and and address problems, and uh, and are you going to use WebMD when you're when you're not feeling well and rely on that uh, when it when it could be I mean it's always serious when you go to WebMD, but uh, <laughs> are you going to use WebMD or are you going to go to a reputable doctor who's got some expertise uh, in that space? So so think about the health the health of your company the same way. Eric, thank you so much. We like to end with flowers too. You are my fraternity brother, but you know, like I, even though we never really connected that way, that was really what the intro was about. It does, you know, kind of feel like I've. I think I've called you a couple of times when the you know shutting things down. You worked very closely with us at Delta Leaf. You made the introduction with Joe, um, who we were very fortunate to, um, you know, have been guiding us as well. And even when things went south, right? Like that's another thing which I feel like a lot of early stage founders don't really understand is that uh, people like you have seen so many scenarios of ups and downs where the more you communicate, the more information that and uh, the context you can give them, the more they could be able to say, well, have you considered this or have you tried this? Because um, I don't think there's anybody else who's really seen as many failures as a as, uh, an awesome lawyer so <laughs> but hey thank you so much for joining us uh we really appreciate you and your time um and uh yeah for our viewers uh thank you for joining us for another episode we'll see you again next week thanks a lot thanks eric thank you we'll, we'll